when we discuss this issue with people, very often their first reaction is shock that this practice even exists. And secondly, a question as to why there wasn't an adequate law to deal with this crime in the first place. So we know that in reality, the situation is extremely complex and there have been huge barriers to bringing about change. So we're really pleased to be joined by a panel of people who have been at the forefront of the campaign to end child sacrifice through the passing of this new law. Um, we were working and still work in the slum communities of Ginger, um, creating safe communities for children. So we work with a local, we were, from the very early days, we were working with a local Ugandan partner that was working on children's rights issues. Um, in Uganda and particularly in those slums of Ginger um, and one particular part of their program was setting up child protection teams so protection teams from within the community with volunteers from the community itself um, working on those teams to make those slums safer places for children so it's trying to stamp out child abuse domestic violence and other um, issues of, of child protection so simply to make those communities safer places for children um, to make them places where children could thrive. So in their day-to-day -day work, and we were supporting them and partnering them and advising them in their day-to-day -day work in one particular slum community, um, Masese 2, it was in, just, they had an incredible um, run of um, cases of child sacrifice. Um, they, were, they managed to stop one or two cases, but um, uh, unfortunately some children died and some were mutilated. Um, and they, they managed over the years through educating the community um, and having a vigilant team of watching for these perpetrators and chasing them out of the community, literally, um, to stamp out child sacrifice in that one community. However, we were aware that um, it was quite difficult to bring the perpetrators to justice. There were gaps in the law. You could bring a perpetrator to justice if they killed a child under the um, penal law, under murder, under the Murder Act, mm. um, or you could. There was some grey area in the trafficking legislation where you could bring a case, but it was very, very tricky to bring these perpetrators to justice. And if our team, who did very well, managed to stop child sacrifice in one community, and they did, there were 13 cases in the last two years when we first started working in that community, um, and a year later, the child protection team having been in place. Um, or there were no more cases. They literally stamped out um, Incredible. child sacrifice. But the problem was the perpetrator then went on to another community and carried on doing it there. So we felt that though we were trying to reach as many communities as possible and set mm. up as many child protection teams as possible um, to make those places safer for children, to make those communities places where they could thrive, um, that actually it was impossible to do that right across Uganda. And we were very concerned that these perpetrators seem to be getting away with it. And that there were also, quite importantly in this whole picture, there were people behind the scene who were financing this. Um, often quite powerful people, often business mm. people. And the mm. belief being that if it's, it's all to do with witchcraft, um, and if you undertake a witchcraft ritual as a belief and you use really pure blood, the blood of a child, whether that child was murdered or whether that child was mutilated, that that would bring you great prosperity that would it bless you, bring you well. So in short, we realized that there was an issue here. We came across it literally day to day in the slums. And, you know, we would like, our vision is long term to have a child protection team in every single community in Uganda. Wouldn't that be great? But there needed to be national protection. Um, we believe in creating protective environments for children at local level. Um, in the family, in the school, in the community, but also at national level. So, so you needed it all to work in parallel, essentially. It needed both to work in parallel. It was no good stamping it out in the at the community level if those perpetrators are then going to other communities and getting away with it. There needed yeah. to be a, na a national protective environment. Yeah. My background is not in law or legislation or anything like that. Um, I'm a video editor by trade and um, back in 2014 I was um, editing a, a daytime show which um, should sort of remain unnamed and I felt a little sort of disillusioned and kind of fancied a bit of a change. Um, I was a bit bored and somebody um, recommended that I contact a lady called Lucy Buck who uh, is an English woman who set up a Ugandan NGO that uh, rescued abandoned babies and found 
uh, Ugandan families to adopt them. And every so often she would need, you know, media volunteers to go over and sort of film for her, edit for her. And I just thought, yeah, why not? So I reached out to her and the next thing I knew I was on a, I was on a flight to Uganda. Um, and it was actually the very first day that I arrived, um, one of the representatives of the organization told me about a little girl who um, was at the baby's home where I'd be working, who had survived child sacrifice. And, you know, I've got Nigerian heritage and I've grown up hearing about witch, witchcraft, witch doctors, juju, the occult, but I had never, I had never ever heard of child sacrifice and I was absolutely horrified. Um, and I knew there and then that A, I couldn't wait to meet this girl and B, I wanted to know everything there was to know about this and, and try and help in any way I can. So um, I met this little girl who at the very beginning was uh, like a shadow. She was uh, visibly traumatized. She would sort of cower in the corner of a room and, and not, not engage with anybody. But over time, her and I just developed this most wonderful bond. And um, it was through her that I learned what this practice was. As Rachel said, it's, it's, you know, there's a widespread belief, not just in Uganda, that when you sacrifice a child, it will lead to riches, prosperity, power. Um, and this little girl was, was rescued moments, moments before she was due to be sacrificed. In Uganda, um, you know, often children are found in construction sites, buried under roads as a blessing. Uh, malls and this little girl was found in a construction site on a construction site and um, the security guard saw what was happening and grabbed her and took her to this organization and I just realized look I had three months in Uganda I didn't really know anyone I had loads of free time and I just thought why not make a little documentary I had access to cameras editing equipment so yeah I spent that time filming I interviewed witch doctors survivors of uh of child sacrifice, siblings who had witnessed their their their, their siblings being being sacrificed, um, parents who had lost their children, members of the judiciary, and formed this little documentary and uh, and showed it all around Uganda. Um, I sort of turned up with a friend of mine with a little projector, portable projector, and just went to as many villages as we could, set up screamed from the rooftops that this is wrong, this is happening, how can we end this? And ended up um, in Kampala with, um, with a sort of a, a screening in a cinema. But we just felt, I just, there was a point where I just thought this wasn't doing anything. You know, it's all well and good saying that this is wrong um, and that it needs to stop, but it didn't feel as though what we were doing was particularly impactful. So I took the uh, film to Parliament and I met the Deputy Speaker. This was all within 2014. Met the Deputy Speaker, Jacob Oluenya, and he said, look, you know, there are, there are gaps in legislation here. I think Uganda could really do with some specific legislation. But he said, look, it's gonna be, it's gonna be difficult. You're gonna have to find a legislator. It's gonna cost money, blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, yep, yep, yep. I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. Found a legislator um, who very kindly offered to draft the bill for free. And uh, I extended my stay even further to help him. And that was my, that was how I, I my journey wow. into this began, yeah. Uh, part of the problem of uh, prosecuting child sacrifice cases that there was no specific law. You know, in prosecution, you prosecute according to what is uh, written in the Penal Code Act and other criminal codes. And so, you know, you have offenses uh, like infanticide. You know, you have homicides of different kinds, but then you have specific ones, and those ones are easy to go after infanticide, suicide, terrorism, you know, vehicular homicide. They are all uh, given their different names. Uh, of course, the rest then we just uh, charge as murder. Now, child sacrifice is a bit uh, elusive because unfortunately, unless the sacrifice has been successful, in other words, unless a child has been killed, 
you could not prosecute for example if you got a witch doctor red handed with a child in their shrine but the child was not killed uh you couldn't prosecute them for anything because there was no law to cover that kind of thing i mean you could stretch and look for something so that was the biggest uh the biggest uh shortcoming because there was nothing specific and so uh unless you really waited for the offense to happen then you could charge with murder and yet you got many many uh, people in their attempt trafficking for child sacrifice or abducting for child sacrifice and that kind of thing so the coming in to force of the law will be able to bridge that gap uh, for example we somebody was found in a, a taxi public transport with a child who was not theirs and uh when you put two and two together you knew this child was on their way to being sacrificed but uh, when the person was uh, taken to court and interrogation he said no i just picked this child and i was trying to establish who the parents were uh, and so on i was just taking good care of them and you know the child at that tender age cannot speak for themselves and and uh, and so we, we had a number of those cases we had another case where a child was found in the witch doctor's shrine and we knew that the next moment really that child was going to be sacrificed but there was no law which talked about attempted child sacrifice there was no law which uh, you know criminalized finding a child in a, in a in a shrine witch doctor's shrine so we had a number of those cases and uh, Unfortunately, the witch doctors had to go off because uh, they were not caught in the actual act. Most importantly was the children. The manner in which these children were killed. They were mutilated while they are still alive. They cut off different parts of their body when they are viewing, when they are seeing them. I mean, it, it was so sad, it's so sad. So I said, I'll keep moving, I'll keep moving, I'll not give up until we see that our children are protected. Not only the children in Uganda, but the children in the whole world. The children have a right to live. Therefore, we should do all it takes to ensure that the children are protected. The manner in which it's done to the children. And secondly, these um, people were, we didn't have a specific law on that. So we fought hard to ensure that these children are protected and they have the right to live. And they, so that's kept me moving. It kept me moving. I have my mother and I work with children as well. So I, I really feel it really bad in me to yeah. see these children going through this. So I kept moving, moving. I gave it all my all and I wasn't going to give up until we get to the point. But um, after I had sort of tracked down that legislator, we'd, he had very kindly um, come up with a draft of a bill and I spent the next sort of two to three years um, going back and forth between London and Uganda. Now, when you introduce a private member's bill, it's, it's very, very costly. Everything costs money. Um, and, you know, I was going back to London, working, saving up enough money to go back to Uganda, support myself and mobilize MPs because you need an awful lot of support um, in order to get something like this off the ground. And I, I did that, that I did know. So I would, you know, come back every couple, go back every couple of months and, um, and meet with MPs. And after about two or three years, I'd, I'd got quite a nice little um, team together. Um, but it was after meeting the Ministry of Gender who was like, look, we'll support you, but you do need quite a lot of money that I thought, right, I'm going to have to fundraise here, which nobody likes to do, without any kind of guarantee. Um, so, uh, you know, and I don't think people in Uganda took me all that seriously, actually. Like, here was this Mzungu, this, what I'm called in Uganda, a white, white person, just, you know, showing their face every couple of months, screaming that we need to do something about child sacrifice, disappearing, then coming back with the same method. Like, it just, it just, I needed, I needed some backing. So, um, I, I was very lucky, actually. I didn't have to look that that long. Um, I was given the details of Children on the Edge through um, a telly friend of mine 
And uh, yeah, it, I think it was probably the first or second email that I sent and Rachel very kindly responded and yeah, met me in Soho during my very short lunch break. So when I got this email from this lady called Annie, it intrigued me and you know, we get loads of emails in the office every day from people wanting help or support or funding for their various initiatives to help children. There was something about Annie's email, her personality came through the email um, and I thought I've got to meet this lady. Mm. And I was bowled over, A, there's the, as you heard just now, um, there's the absolute need to bring um, new legislation, there was the need um, to bring new legislation in Uganda to cover this huge and very serious gap. Um, but to meet someone who had decided to try and do that and to meet a young lady, a um, mm. young woman who was very tenacious and um, I was just inspired by her passion, I was inspired by her commitment, I was inspired by her single-mindedness. Um, it was, I knew it would be a David and Goliath type battle, but I just felt that she was a David and she had definitely taken on a Goliath, um, but she was up for the battle. Um, so yeah, just something in her spirit, something about it. I thought if anyone can do it, she can do it. I was just totally inspired by her absolute passion and dedication. And also it was a ridiculous thing to, to say and to try and do. It was yeah. so ridiculous to say, we're going to bring new legislation. I'm going to try and bring new legislation in Uganda, but I knew the need for it. I thought, you know what? We're known as an organization for taking risks, um, certainly to try and protect the most vulnerable children around the world. And I thought we're gonna take a risk and back this woman and support her. Everyone, yeah. a lot of major agencies would not touch it with a barge pole um, and said that, and actually a couple of very senior executives from net agencies that I won't mention the names of called me up and said that, what are we doing? Are we stupid? Did we not know that we're just throwing money down a black hole that would disappear and nothing would change? Um, but I, yeah, I, I believed in what Annie was doing and I believed in her um, and her passion uh, you know, and her absolute dedication to the cause. So um, what we didn't know at that point was how long it would take. So I got introduced to this when uh, Annie walked into my office when I was director of public prosecutions. And as director, you meet many people with many stories. And so you always uh, listen and uh, see who is uh, serious, who has something important. And so when Annie walked in and she was telling me about this, I, I had heard about the need for this law. But again, as director, you, you have to spend your energies prosecuting the offenses that are already available to you. So when she came in, and uh, as somebody else has already mentioned, I looked at this uh, young girl and uh, she was so passionate and i thought wow so she struck a nerve because in my earlier days as a high court judge i had handled the matter of child sacrifice and uh, that was 2011 before the advent in uganda of uh, social media as we know it but i had never handled a case where i got so much feedback from the public Basically, my my mailbox and my my phone message uh, box were so full of people saying thank you, you have done this. So the thing of child sacrifice kind of stayed with me. And so when Annie came, it kind of struck a chord. Of course, one of the challenges is uh, I was not and I'm not a member of parliament, so my influence was really little. I would say that there are probably three main challenges. I think firstly, uh, finan financial difficulties. Um, as I said earlier, it, it costs um, an astronomical amount to push a bill like this through. Um, everything costs money. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, I, I when I met Children on the Edge that we had a sort of budget in mind, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> I do remember not. <laughs> I really, it was a laughable amount in comparison to, I think, what was probably spent. And I think, you know, every time we thought that this would be, you know, this would be the last meeting, this would be the last event, there was always another meeting and always another meeting. And these meetings cost thousands. They're not just, um, you know, and everything, everything costs. So I think financially, um, yeah, th that, that was a real, real challenge. I think the second challenge was finding a team that um, that we could trust, um, you know, and finding a team who 
were, were in this for the right reasons for, for to protect these children um, because not not everybody who I met along this journey uh, was and it took um, a long time and a lot of uh, disappointment um, to kind of figure out who who I could trust who we could trust and and who just had to go um, but I'm pleased to say that you know by the end our core team um, you know, were I could I, I could trust them with anything, and and you know we we were able to finally get this through. So, but that that was difficult, not knowing, not knowing who who I can who I can count on really. And then the last one I'd say um, was fear actually, because especially early on, um, you know, child sacrifice is a really nasty business. There are people who profit from this, and you know, I definitely made a name for myself going over and, and and not being particularly quiet about the fact that I was going to dedicate everything I had to stop this practice. And, you know, I was a scared, scared. Um, yeah. I had threats. Um, I had people coming to my house demanding to know where I, where, I, where I was. I was followed. I was nearly deported. I was told that, you know, I better stop this, otherwise there'll be consequences and all of this. So that, that I think one of the biggest challenges was, um, just constantly reminding myself that this is bigger than me um, and that I've just got to carry on no matter, you know, no, no matter what. Um, yeah. But in a weird way, whenever I did get a kind of threat, um, it just kind of spurred me on in a way because it meant that I was getting that little bit closer and that, you know, I was I was a threat actually and what, what I was doing was threatening to these people. We, knew we needed this law and yet it was being so slow in moving. You know what they say about uh, making laws and, uh, and, and making sausages that really if you want to, to, to enjoy them after that you don't need to see the process. So really th this was one of those which I was following closely through Annie and I could see things were not working out as fast and uh, somebody from outside Uganda was more passionate about it than uh, the people who should be the representatives of the people. Yeah. Brilliant. Can I can I jump in actually cuz Mike when I I I spoke about, you know, how things got dangerous, um it was during that time where you know, Mike he really saved me and and the bill at that point because it was then uh, everything had sort of severed. I, I felt like there was nowhere to turn. Um, this direction would have led to danger. This direction would have led to danger. And if I did nothing, the bill would go nowhere. So for three months, I sort of sat in Uganda, not wanting to come home because I didn't want to feel like a failure, but not wanting to make a move because I was terrified. And after so long, I, I reached out to Mike and it was you who kind of resurrected the bill. Um, so. I know I've thanked you, but I just wanted people on this on this call to, to just realise and understand just how instrumental you were um, in this journey. Yes, it took much longer than we expected, but the time we took was also all involving. We had to use it to engage all the stakeholders, engage with the Law Reform Commission, engage with the the Uganda Law Society, and even do benchmarking uh, within East Africa. So the next step is for the president to assent to the bill, and uh, the president needs to assent to it before it becomes, once the president has uh, appended his signature, then it becomes law. Once it has become law, then uh, you need to work on uh, sensitizing the public, especially the relevant public. And then uh, you need to sensitize the police. We talked about setting up a unit in police. You then would need to set up a unit in uh, prosecution. Then you would need to set up a unit or train some people in the judiciary because the matter has to be investigated properly, prosecuted properly, and adjudicated properly. So you need uh, sensitization in those uh, areas. But, uh, once it becomes law, then it will become easier for police to investigate. 
because uh, there is a specific law and the uh, police, the investigators and the prosecutors, they act when there is uh, an actual law. So uh, to move on to something else, and hopefully they would move on to something uh, more profitable and more productive and uh, that will contribute better to the country. So I hope they would move on to agriculture and all. We have plenty of land for them to farm. So with deterrent in uh, uh, several of those areas, yeah, I'm hoping they would move on to something more, more productive. There are networks, there are agencies, there's people that we refer to. Um, not enough of it, I'd say. There is, there needs to be more work done on that. Yeah, it, it was amazing. It was the best day of my life when the, the bill passed. We were having a staff meeting, and then after the meeting, I was preparing to go to Kampala the following day because we thought the bill would be read the following day. So getting to office again, I, I check my, my phone, messages are on, missed calls, the bill is being read. I screamed to the top of my voice, I couldn't <laughs> believe it. And I'd ask the staff, please let us pray, the bill is here, it's going to pass tomorrow, let's pray. Not knowing that it was already going on in, in parliament. So we had to connect, connect the computers, laptops, phones, so we could follow. So we started following every step and everyone was screaming within their offices and it was being supported overwhelmingly by the members of parliament. I was so happy. I couldn't believe all the time that we went through and we knew the, the 10th parliament was um, moving on and then I couldn't imagine it, the bill going to the 11th parliament. So I was like, God, thank you. This is the best gift that you have given us as children on the age. This is the best gift that you're giving to the children we are taking care of. Not only children in Uganda, but children of the whole world. Because I know even other countries are going to benchmark on how this happened. It was a long way, but it's very, very amazing. It was the greatest time of our life. We cried for almost a whole week. And at least I know this is one thing that we have done for the um, country and the whole world. We are very, very grateful. Annie, thank you for, so much for your support. And I hope you are wiping your tears now. Oh, thank I, you for being here for us. Children I can begin to cry. because be Rachel, Rachel, I don't know. Rachel was the first person to call me. And I was like, my goodness, I can't believe this. I was just in tears. I couldn't believe all this long. We've gotten there. Two was the last minute. I was so, so excited and I'm still excited. But though we still have a, some way to go, we still have to sensitize the people and letting them know that um, having a law when the president ascends does not mean that we shouldn't take care of our children. Mm. Because when the child is sacrificed, the law does not bring back a life. No, the child is gone. So it remains our sole responsibility as parents to take good care of our children. is a to see it really take hold and be implemented in Uganda um, but also that it, the practice is eventually wiped out in Uganda because the law is strong and that it you know puts people off from actually practicing this heinous act that no longer becomes profitable to do it um, and that they lead the way particularly across the nation of Africa but there are other countries as well and then for us personally as Children on the Edge we will continue working grassroots um, in all of those slum communities and our plan is and it's already starting to take shape is to see the child protection team model which is an amazing model because as I mentioned earlier it's made up of volunteers from their own communities who are trained to make their own communities safer for children so we'll continue working with those grassroots teams to make their communities safer to make their communities places where children can thrive and also to, we can now train them on this new legislation and explain how you can actually use the law to bring perpetrators to justice once we have it implemented. So um, mm. yeah, we'll continue. The plan is to expand the child protection team model in different parts of Uganda, in key areas where there are very vulnerable children um, and to create many more safer communities, but to educate and train on this new legislation. So. positive they will they will have to come and benchmark and see how we did it because even in uganda here some people are telling us this is very highly political will you make it it won't go through but we never gave up 
But the fact that we have done it up to this point, when the president assents to it, to, to it and it becomes law, we are sure other countries will come and have a benchmark and will protect and save lives of so many children around the world. I'm very positive that will happen because it's a law of its own kind. Yeah, can I, I can I jump in there? It's the very first law. There's no other legislation like this that exists in the world. There are a couple of provisions in a in an Indian law. Um, however, this is the first law of its kind that is comprehensive, that is absolutely watertight. It completely defines child sacrifice and creates an offence for this. So we've done the hard work, which means that other countries suffering from this, as as you know, my team has said, can just very, very easily grab our law, localize it and protect the children of their own country. And that has got to be, I think that is part of the legacy of this journey. Yeah, that um, it should hopefully be a cost effective, very easy sort of way to, you know, and quick way to protect as many children as possible um, in, in other countries that are suffering from this. Um, and I think that that is what I'm really most proud of.